tonight, as we go through, as I told you in our introduction, um, tonight's study, our Women of the Word, is on Miriam. Um, while I'm going to talk for a minute, you can open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. Uh, we finished our women in Genesis that we've covered, and so the next woman on the list as we make our way through the Bible looking at the women is Miriam. Um, but before we get to her, I want to say something. The Bible is full of instructions and patterns. God gives us what we need to succeed in life, in everything, in marriage, in work, in parenting, in relationships, in relating to other people. Everything we need for life and godliness is in this book. And God lays it out in patterns. As you begin to study, study scripture, these patterns show themselves. And God says over and over again, if you do this, this will happen. I don't know about you. I love instructions. I like recipes. I like manuals. When I get a new electronic or doodad, I will literally spend an hour reading through the manual because I want to know what my thing does. I want to know all the ins and outs of every doodad and, and use it to its fullest capacity. Um, and then if I, it's something that's too hard for me to cover, I'll post those instructions somewhere that I can flip to them really quick. For example, I have a dehydrator, right? And the first time I got my dehydrator, I wanted to know the, the ins and outs of this thing. So actually on one of my cupboards, you open up and there's my whole dehydrator, like how long to do stuff. And um, I just like being told what to do. I like a guarantee that if I do this, this is how it's going to come out. When I look up a recipe for something online or I'm Googling something, I always want to find a recipe that's got at least 10 reviews on it where people have tried it and said, this works great. Or if you go through their views and they all say, hey, this is a great recipe, but every one of us says it's way too much salt. Cut the salt in half. And then you're like, okay, it's tested, it's true. If I do these steps, I'm going to get this result. And then you do, and you're like, woohoo! And you take credit for it, even though all you did was follow the instructions, right? But hey, I followed the instructions, so good job, me, right? But God's word has that. Um, I'm going to be tonight giving you a lot of supplemental verses that kind of emphasize what I'm saying. You can write them down if you want to, but I'm just going to read them to you, okay? We'll read the main meat of our scripture together tonight, but I'm going to give you some supplemental verses. For example, Jeremiah 33, 2 through 3 says this, Thus says the Lord who made it, who formed it to establish it. He's talking about the world and his word and his ways. He made it. He says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. God is the creator of the recipe, the creator of the instructions of life. And he says, call to me and ask me about it. I want to show you how to succeed. Whatever your problem is, whatever season you're facing, if you're like, man, my marriage is on the rocks, my relationship with my kids, I don't know how to relate to them. I have this nephew that I just, whatever it is, I'm struggling at work, I'm struggling with parenting, I'm struggling with this. God says, I made it, so call to me and ask me about it. I want to show you how to do it. I'll give you the instructions so that you succeed in whatever that thing is. Um, quick example of this, patterns and instructions in the Bible. I've told you bef before and I've shared with you that I am a worrier. And I am a worrier to an extreme level, <laughs> an unhealthy level sometimes, where it almost cripples me in fear to do certain things. Not be up here talking, I could do this all day, where some of you would be like, terrified. I can't, I don't know, this is just, a, it's a gift, that's why I can't. But in other areas, I freak out, right? And I, gosh, my stomach just turns into knots and I just turn into a bowl of jelly. Well, one of the patterns that God has shown me, if I actually do this thing, he really helps me with my anxiety to a level that it just works. It works every time. It's found in Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is a psalm for the, for the worrier, for the anxious one, for the one who has problems <laughs> getting from A to B to C on certain things. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, and I'm not going to get into it because this isn't tonight's message, but I'm going to tell you what the pattern is, okay, just so you know. The first part in Psalm 37, God tells us, don't fret. Don't fret. 
And sometimes we think, well, I can't help it because all this stuff. And God says, "Uh uh-uh, you can help it. Don't fret. The next part is trust you find in that in that pattern. Don't fret. Instead, we trust. Okay, Lord, you're going to take care of this. You're going to get me through this. You're going to walk with me. The third part is to delight in the Lord, to sit there and actually go, all right, God, instead of looking at this, let me look at all the stuff you have done. Let me look at all the good points you are doing and have done in the past and begin to delight in him. Oh, God, you're so good for this and that. Oh, God, you gave me this today. Oh, God, the sun's shining so wonderfully out there. Lord, my day is awful, but look, I have a house. And finding those things to delight in him. Then committing your way to the Lord, and that's where you find rest. It's a pattern. You don't fret, you trust, you delight, you commit, and you rest. And it works every time. Because while you're delighting in the Lord, you can't possibly fret over whatever the other thing is. Your brain can't do both things at once. And if you take your brain and your heart through these actions, God takes care of the problem. And you may have to do it three times in a day. You may have to do it 50 times in a day when that worry comes back. But you start all over again. You don't fret. You trust, delight, commit, and rest. I love it. Now, I'm not super smart to just pick out these patterns in Scripture. This is not my own thing. This is things I've learned from other Bible studies and other women sharing these patterns. And I go, oh, I've always read Psalm 37. I just didn't quite recognize that it was a pattern. And now that I see it, I can follow it. So listen to other Bible studies, too. You hear different perspectives on what people have to share. That one I took from Kay Smith, um, as well as some of the other things in tonight's study. Um, Now, one of these patterns came out in this study of Miriam. As I was going through her life and looking at her, it's interesting because I didn't see it at first. And then listening to a totally unrelated Bible study on something else, I thought, there's the pattern. It's right here. So I'm excited to share that with you tonight. Are you guys ready for this? All right. So first, who's Miriam, right? Genesis closes, that first book that has all those important stories, it closes with um, Israel and all the children of Israel, God's family so far, being taken down to Egypt. Then now they went down to Egypt because there was a famine and God was going to take care of them there through a man called Joseph. Totally different story. But right now all of the Israelites, their whole families are in Egypt. Um, Exodus, the next book of the Bible, opens with uh, it's about 400 years later, and the, the Israelite families have grown so big and so numerous that the Pharaoh in Egypt panics because he sees this huge group of people and thinks, what if they attack us? Like, they're so strong. We're, we're actually legitimately worried about them. So they enslave the people, and they turn them into slaves. And now the Israelite families are slaves in Egypt, right? And so the whole point of the exodus, uh, an easy way to remember what the book is about, is it's the exit, right? You see these exit signs? They could say exodus. You need to get out of the building? You exodus right out, right? You exit. So it's Israel's exit from Egypt to go back up to the promised land where God had told them they would be. And he uses someone to do it. You guys remember who? Say it out loud. Moses. Moses was the one in Exodus that God used as the deliverer. He raised him up so that he could do, you guys know, the ten plagues and uh, the Passover and then the Red Sea, right? So Moses is the key figure. He's the key figure of the book of Exodus. Uh, And you guys know how the story starts with uh, the Pharaoh was so worried about the population that his population control was killing all the baby boys, chucking them in the Nile River, right? Well, there was one little baby boy born named Moses. Now, he wasn't named Moses yet. He was just a baby boy. They hadn't even given him a name. But his mother fell in love with him, of course, as mothers do, and she hid him for like three months. But it got to the point where she couldn't hide him anymore. So she did what she thought was best, and she made a little basket. Um, it's, it's funny, in the Bible, it's called an ark. Now, when I think of ark, I think of Noah's gigantic ark, but it says she made a little ark. I'm like, okay. So she made a little boat, a little basket boat, and she put pitch and tar and stuff all around the outside to keep it waterproof. Now, 
the movies will make you think that she went up to the top of the riverbank and put the little boat in, and then, like in Prince of Egypt, you guys see that? And it's going through, and there's hippos, and it's almost getting eaten by a crocodile, and it's floating down the Nile River, and it's just intense and scary, and then God brings it in this. No, no, no. The Bible says she set it in the reeds. So this little ark wasn't like, you know, tumultuous. It wasn't like, oh my goodness. She just set it in the reeds and then walked away. Now that, I'm sure, was tumultuous for her. I can't imagine setting my baby in a basket and knowing I have to leave and trusting God to take care of it. But God did, right? And this is where we pick up on Miriam because Miriam was Moses's sister, okay? So there's where we're getting Miriam from. She's this great deliverer of the people. She's his sister. Now we pick up her story in Exodus chapter 2. I'm going to pick it up in verse 3. So follow with me. When she, Moses' mother, could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with an asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, oh, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, here's Miriam, she said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. That's what Moses' name meant, right? I drew him out. Okay, so really interesting. Now, when I first read this and I was going through and studying Miriam again, I realized her name isn't mentioned. It doesn't say Miriam. It says Moses' sister. So I'm like, well, could it be that Moses had a different sister? So I'm studying and trying to look and see why do we think that this was Miriam. And um, basically, because there's two verses in other parts in Scripture, um, one in Numbers and one in Chronicles, where it's listing the children of Moses' parents. And very specifically in those two verses, it said, they had Moses, and they had Aaron, and they had Miriam. And that's where it leaves it. So that's why most people think it had to be Miriam, because it doesn't sound from other Scriptures like there were other members of the family. There you go, in case you were wondering like I did. Now, how old was she right here? Obviously, she's older than Moses. She's also older than Aaron. Aaron, at this time, we know was three. He's three years older than Moses. So there's Mo baby Moses, and then Aaron's the middle child, and then there's Miriam. Some people think maybe she was five. I'm reading her words to Pharaoh's daughter. I'm like, there's no way she was five. She's so articulate and the like this plan of, can I go get my mom to watch a baby? I feel like she had to be a little older. Some people think maybe she was as old as 12 at this point. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. She's the big sister of the family, okay? Now, I love even just this story because God put Miriam in this situation to save her little brother. She was instrumental in delivering the deliverer of Israel. So in a sense, the things that we do, ladies, even the little things we do, they have ripple effects. And it's amazing, I, I think in heaven one day when we get there, I think God's going to show us the ripple effects of how when we affected one person and how that person made an effect and that person made an effect. And I think we'll even get credits for the ripples, you know, for, for us doing that one faithful thing and then God using that in someone else's life. It, it reminds me too of how important just one person is to the Lord. Um, last year in our co-op, we, we did a whole thing on space. 
Because outer space is just fun for kids. I mean, you talk about rocket ships and astronauts and planets. And, and Pastor Mike um, came and did a presentation for our uh, little astronaut, you know, uh, co-op, homeschool co-op. And he was showing the kids these gigantic planets. If you've ever looked at astronomy, or uh, it, you get overwhelmed very quickly by how big our universe is. How many bajillion stars are out there, and God knows everyone by name. And how our sun is actually one of the smallest suns in our galaxy. There are suns that are millions of times bigger than our sun. And you just, oh my gosh, it's so big. And it makes you feel so small. And I love the way Pastor Mike ended his presentation. It was that sometimes we look at big things and we think how much God must love big things. Because we love big things. We like big gifts. That's why when you go through the store right now, as they have all the Valentine stuff out, didn't you hate it? They put the Christmas stuff away and immediately the Valentine stuff took its place. You're like, it's months away. But it's why you go through the Valentine's aisle and you see Kit Kat bars the size of a bazooka, right? Because something about us thinks bigger is better sometimes, right? But with God, it's not that way. He doesn't love someone because of what a big impact they can make. God is so enamored with the one single life. And I, the way Mike phrased it, he was like, God isn't about the big, he's about the special. And what we realize is God thinks we are special. No matter, you may not have an impact of being a Moses where you have a huge audience and a huge, you know, one classroom may be all you get. One family may be all you get. Two kids. Maybe it's one neighbor that God's put in your life or one person. That is so important to the Lord. It, it's not about the big. It's about the special. And he thinks you are pretty special. And that's why even if this Bible study dwindles down to two or three. I don't think that's the Lord saying, oh, you better stop because it's dead. I think it's, all right, here's the chance to invest in two or three because this is what I have for you right now. And I just, I always have to remind myself about that because sometimes when you're a mom and you're at home or you're just, you know, you only have this little sphere of influence, you think, well, what good could this possibly really do? The truth is much good. Much good, because that's where God has placed you right now. For Miriam, that's where God had placed her. And just by being a big sister, she was instrumental in saving Moses' life. Now, that's not the only thing God had for Miriam, okay? We're giving you a little background on her before I get into that pattern. The first time we're actually told her name is if you flip a few chapters to Exodus 15. We're going to do that real quick. So over in Exodus 15, now you're about halfway through the book of Exodus, okay? The plagues have happened. God has sent uh, all these things to deliver his people. And as you know, the big climax of that was at the Red Sea, right? Where God parted the waters and the people walked through the sea. Um, and it was amazing. It's why we call God the way maker when you hear that, that in in. Um, Sarah did a song on Sunday, too, that talked about Jesus making a highway out of oceans. And it's like, he can do it. He did it here, and this is what we're talking about, right? He paved it way. So after that happened, here in Exodus 15, we see something called the Song of Moses. Moses leads the congregation in this song of praise. God, look what you've done. Um, it's pretty awesome. I'm going to read to you uh, the first two verses. We're not going to read the whole song. We'll just get a, a little taste of what it was about. It says in 15, verse 1, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. He's talking about the Egyptians who he delivered them from. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. And then it keeps going. It keeps talking about this deliverance. It's a beautiful song if you have a chance to go back and read it. It's really good. But let's get to where Miriam is. 
we see Miriam all the way down in verse 20. So jump down to verse 20 in chapter 15, and it says this. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. She repeats the song of Moses back to them. And we see her bringing out a timbrel, which in my mind, I picture a tambourine, right? It's this musical instrument that she has. And she leads the women in dancing and praising. I'm like, oh man, she was in women's ministry and worship ministry, right? That, those were her ministries here. But not only that, she's called in this verse a prophetess. It's the very first time in scripture that a female is called a prophet. She is the first prophetess listed in scripture. Now, what is a prophetess? It's not just someone who tells the future, okay? Don't picture fortune telling as part of prophecy. God does use prophecy to tell the future, but the biggest part of a prophet was to be a spokesperson for God. God would tell them what to say and they would tell the people. God had a relationship with Miriam that was very special. God spoke to Miriam and Miriam's job was to speak God's words to the people. Now we aren't given more detail than that. I don't know if it was only to the women or if she was a speaker to all of Israel. I don't know, but it's a pretty special job she had. She had this ministry of leading others in the Lord. Um, I just think that that's so cool, especially when you consider how old she is here. According to Exodus 7, that happened right before this, Moses at this time was 80, okay? Which makes Aaron 83 and makes Miriam anywhere from 85 to 92, Okay, so she's not a little chicken, spring chicken out there dancing with her timbrel. She's an older gal who's leading the other women in praise. And I love that about her because I just think, you know, sometimes I'm going to be 38 next month. And sometimes I feel really old. This is this year would be my I know, I know all of you who are older than me are like, Ugh. but you feel that way. And I'm sure you did when you were my age, too. This year would have been my 20-year high school reunion. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been out of high school for 20 years. I don't get mistaken, ever. No one ever cards me at Walmart when I buy a Sharpie. They, don't, they just look at me and they, they, you know, you're supposed to be over 18 to buy Sharpie or spray paint. When I'm either buying my spray paint or my Sharpies, they just look at me and they check it right through. And I'm like, oh, okay. I told Mark the other day, I'm like, my dimples are getting wrinkles. I'm getting wrinkly dimples. But... As I look at these ladies in scripture and I see how they've been following the Lord all these years and they continue to follow him, it inspires me. And I think, Lord, you're not done with me yet. I still got a few more years to go. And I don't think a single one of you women in here is 92. I think you can look at this and say, all right, Lord, I got a few more years to go. I got more for you to do for me, more ways I can lead, more ways I can serve you. Now, God had this special gift for her. I have this whole other section on being a prophetess. I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to keep going. But my question to you is, what gifts has God given you? For Miriam, it was not only saving Moses as a baby, but using her as a spokeswoman and playing the timbrel, whatever that looked like, and, and leading the other women in song. Now, what are your gifts? What is God having you do? And how is God using you? Recognize that whatever it is he's given you to do, he's given you and called you for his good pleasure. Our number one job in life as Christians is to please God in whatever way that looks like. Pleasing him, created to please. He has a purpose for you. And again, it might be a small purpose compared to what the world says, but that small purpose is special. And that's what he has for you to do. I love um, John 15, 16, when Jesus was telling his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you so that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit might remain. He chooses us and he chooses our ministry. Now, what happens if you don't like 
the ministry that God has called you to? That's a very good question. And that, I think, is where the pattern comes out in Miriam's life. You see, I thought there was going to be way more on Miriam in the scripture when I started studying her. She's only mentioned like seven times her name comes up. She, and two of them are like just because she was part of this family. And another one's because she was reminded of by somebody else. There really isn't much to her except there's one whole chapter where she's very prominent. Now it's in the book of Numbers. Will you guys flip with me? One more book to the right. So you have Genesis, Exodus, um, sorry, two more books, Leviticus and then Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. And we're going to go to Numbers chapter 12. It's not a good chapter. Just going to prepare you for that right now, okay? So what's been going on since then? It's been a couple of years, okay? Between Miriam the prophetess leading everybody in song and God, you're so good. And now it's been a couple of years. God's been taking them through the desert. Now, it didn't take a couple years to get from point A to point B on the map. Sometimes you and I think that God loves to work in straight lines. God has me here, and then he'll have me here, and that's where I'm going. God, have you ever been in an airplane and looked down and seen a river? You never see rivers in straight lines unless a man created it. And I don't mean a man, I mean a human being, right? We like our straight lines from here to there. If you look at natural rivers, where do they go? They're spaghetti noodles all over the map, right? And as God has taken his children from the Red Sea in Egypt, taking them to the promised land, he does this whole, whoop, we're going here, and we're going here, and we're going here. Why? Because he's using that time to teach them about himself. He gives them the Ten Commandments. He's teaching them how to build the tabernacle, how he wants to be worshipped. He's showing his children the instructions for how they're going to continue on as his people. And he takes two years to do it. I was reading a thing that said if he had really, if the people were trying to get from the Red Sea to the Promised Land, um, if they had only traveled one mile a day, one mile is not very far. If they had just gone one mile a day, they would have gotten there within nine months, nine to 11 months. And so if they'd gone like five miles a day, they could have been there in like a month or two, truly, if they were booking it. But God took them two years, right, to get to this first time in the wilderness. This isn't counting the 40 years they wandered. That's later. This is just getting there to the first gate. So what's happened in these two years? Well, Moses has been no doubt established as the leader of the people, right? And not only that, God chose Moses and Miriam's brother Aaron to become the head priest, to start leading the worship of the people. So Moses has this number one position, and Aaron has this number two position. Where's Miriam? Well, she's not number one, and she's not number two. And we find out in Numbers 12 that she was not very happy about it. So let's see, okay? Picking up in Numbers chapter 12, it says this. Then Miriam, she's noted here first because she's the instigator, okay? Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Pause there for a second. Now here first comes this nonsense about this Ethiopian woman. I believe in looking at this and looking at the rest of this scripture that the Ethiopian woman that Moses married had absolutely nothing to do with Miriam's complaint. But usually, we as women especially, when we have a problem with someone, we tend to take a backdoor route in getting to that problem and we tend to find everything else wrong with the person that we don't like. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been jealous of someone so you automatically assume, oh, they're not a very good person or, oh, they just, and you nitpick everything they do because you already have some other problem with them in their heart? When I first met my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, I was 14, 15, and uh, he had brought her on a date and like introduced her to our family. And um, her name's Sarah, and uh, she was just this be she's just beautiful. She is a beautiful woman. Um, she's Korean, 
uh, South Korean born, but American raised. She was adopted when she was two. So she's totally American, but totally Korean in out. I don't know what you call it, a banana, yellow on the outside and white on the inside. I think that was her words one time, okay? So um, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm not trying to be racist. It's just who she is. But she's so pretty, and she was really funny and outgoing, and I immediately hated her. I just didn't like her at all. I just knew that there was something about her that just, uh, and the real problem, if had I diagnosed it in my 14, 15-year-old heart, was that I was jealous. I was a tall, awkward, thicker girl who just, I don't know, I was going through one of those phases, and, and she was everything I wasn't, petite and outgoing and just, just beautiful inside and out. And it's amazing how we just get that seed of, oh, well, I just don't like her. And then we'll pick everything. I think that's what Miriam was doing with Moses' wife, the Ethiopian. Oh, she has darker skin than me, and oh, she's a different culture, and oh, don't you guys think that Moses shouldn't have married this woman? Oh my gosh, can you believe that Moses married him? And I, you can just hear the where the true seed comes in verse 2. She's jealous that God has been speaking through Moses, even though she had been a prophetess, and hadn't God spoken through me? So why does Moses get to be up here? She was no longer happy with the role that God had given her. And instead of the pattern we're going to talk about in a minute, instead of following a pattern and seeing, Lord, what should I do about this? She tries to steal his office. She tries to demean his office by attacking his wife and going in a roundabout way. Little side note, if you ever feel under attack from somebody, recognize that that's probably not the true issue. There probably is something else. There could be something underlying that they're really attacking. So before you get all defensive about whatever it is you're doing, pray and say, Lord, is this really what the attack is? Or is there a barb underneath this that really shows what this person is having a problem with? The Holy Spirit will reveal you those things to you. You just got to ask. Anyway, there's jealousy here. There's a bitterness and a resentment. Miriam had become dissatisfied and... What happens? Let's pick up in verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who are on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. This is how God communicated with his prophets. He would give them visions. He would give them dreams. And he would show them what he was doing in that kind of way. Verse 7, not so with Moses. Moses was different. He is faithful in all my house, God says. I speak with him face to face even plainly and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God is telling Aaron and Miriam, I do not talk to Moses the same way I talk to you. Do you realize that God speaks to each of us differently? That God does not relate to you the same way maybe he relates to your mother or your other sister, or someone else in your family, or another church family member, he may speak to them completely different than he does to you. And if you start nitpicking the way they're serving the Lord, you might have the Lord take you a step back and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Are they your servant or are they my servant? Am I allowed to deal with them a different way than I deal with you? Because I'm unique. God isn't put in a box. He does different things with different people, right? So the anger of the Lord, verse 9, was aroused against them, and he departed. And when he departed above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. Pause there for a second. I think this is pretty interesting. God uh, shows them that, one, they're wrong. Her, her whole thing about how God's speaking 
uh, to Moses is wrong. Her wanting Moses' position is wrong. It's for God to decide where people are. I'm up here not because I'm some amazing order or whatever, but I don't know why. God has given me this position right now to be the leader of Monday Night Women's Study, and it may change. It hasn't always been this way. There have been other women's study leaders. I'm blessed to be here. I'm glad to be here. But I could get in my heart a, well, how many women are at Tuesday studies with Judy? How many, how many go there? And what about these other Bible studies that you see online where there's like 400 women in the room? Why didn't God call me there? If I can get really personal with you guys, I'm going to share a struggle that I had in the past. Had, have, the Lord's still working on me. I have this gift of teaching and I love it. And I always thought, Lord, I'd make a really good pastor's wife. <laughs> right? I grew up as a pastor's kid. My whole life I've been a pastor's kid. I've seen my mom and, I, and, and my mother-in-law is a pastor's wife. Okay? So my mom and my mother-in-law, two of my main mentors in my life, are both pastor's wives. Guess what? My oldest sister married a man who became a pastor. So my oldest sister is a pastor's wife. My youngest sister married a man who became a pastor. So my youngest sister is a pastor's wife. My brother's different. We won't talk about him. But every member of my immediate family is either a pastor or a pastor's wife. And for a long time, I struggled with that because my husband was not called to be a pastor. He hates teaching. Not, not that he, he hates God's word. He loves God's word. But he is one who gets up in front of people and feels like throwing up. He doesn't, and he can teach. I've heard him teach. He's had opportunities to speak. He takes no joy out of it, and it's never been something that's been on his heart to do. And I think, God, what a waste of my talent. I was born to be this. I'm not kidding, you guys. I struggled with this, especially when the pastor's wives' conferences come around. And there go all my family members off to the pastor's wife's conference. And I'm not invited because I'm not a pastor's wife. Now, sometimes my mom's like, Andrea, you should come. And I'm like, why? You know, I'm not a pastor's wife. But it really has sometimes been a struggle where I'm like, why not? And the Lord constantly shows me like, Andrea, you're still special. I need that. Pick me up sometimes. I don't know if you do sometimes. I need the Lord to tell me that I'm special. I need the Lord to tell me that he loves me and that he gave me the gifts that he gave me as opposed to someone else in the family because we all want to feel special. We all want to feel loved and needed and appreciated. It's built into us. And so I've struggled with where Miriam's at. I've looked at my brothers and sisters and said, well, why them, God? And the Lord looks and says, because, because I chose them. And because I have a different job for them than I do for you. Are you okay with that? Can you live with that? Can you let me do the special thing I want to do in you? Because it's special, Andrea, but it might not be their special. It might be my special for you. Can you be happy with that? Can you grow with that? And I've had to come to the place sometimes where I weep and I say, yes, Lord. <laughs> Honestly, okay, Lord. Can you do that in me? Can you show me where you want me to be? Because I don't want to be a Miriam. I don't want to lose out on the office that I've been given. You realize the next time she's mentioned in Scripture is when she dies. For about 40 years from this point, she dies. And that's the only time her name's mentioned again, is at her death. And I think, oh, what she lost in those 40 years. And maybe she gained some of it back. Maybe she still had a place. I don't know. But I don't want to be that. I don't want to lose out on what God has because I'm pining for someone else's life or what they have, right? I think it's ironic, too, that she's, her first problem was with the skin color of Moses' new wife, and then God's like, all right, I'm going to take away all your color, <laughs> right? Leprosy, when you became leprous, your skin became super white because it was all dying. And I think, oh, man, you had a big problem with her color, and now you got no color, <laughs> right? Now, We'll continue in the story, and as you continue, Moses prays for Miriam, and God says, send her out of the camp for seven days, and when she comes back, she'll be healed. So God heals Miriam. He restores her. She's able to continue life, right? Because as you know, in the Old Testament, if you got leprosy, that was it. You're out of the camp. You're, you have a death sentence because it's so contagious. You have to remove yourself. And so God removes her for just a week and then brings her back, and they move on. Now, where is the pattern? 
what happens here in this? And I'm like, Lord, what can you teach us from this life of Miriam? First, the pa- first pattern we see are the consequences when we become unsatisfied with God's calling for our life. When we seek something that's not ours and we lose contentment with where God has us. The big part is it hits us like a cancer. It hits us like leprosy and we lose our effectiveness. Don't follow that pattern, okay? The pattern we want to follow, God shows us the fix in James chapter 4. Can you guys flip with me? We're going to go all the way to the New Testament, and we're going to go to the book of James. It's almost all the way to the end. If you find Revelation, just go back a couple books, and you'll find the book of James. It's a letter written by Jesus' half-brother, right, James. Uh, It's such a good book, and it's so full of practical wisdom. Oh, it's so practical. I love the book of James. Um, But we're going to read from chapter 4 because I feel like, and it's so weird, you guys. God is so good. I was listening to a Bible study on this chapter, and I realized how it perfectly related to Miriam's situation, just perfectly. And only God can do that. I love how he does. So I'm going to pick up in James chapter 4, verse 1. I'm just going to read you the first 10 verses, and then we'll talk about it. I'm going to try and get through this um, (laughs) semi-quickly. Here we go. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I wish I had time to really break this down. If you want to get into it a little more, go on the website, ccwomentowomen.com. I've told you about that before, right? The CC is for Calvary Chapel, ccwomentowomen.com. Click on Kay Smith. She, I'm just, I know, I'm going to share so much of hers with you because I've been getting so much out of it. And listen to her message called Walk with God. She breaks this one down a whole lot in this pattern. I'm going to give it to you a little fairly quickly on how I think it relates to Miriam. Did you hear her heart in that first part of James 4 of where do wars come from among you? She was the one stirring up the war amongst the family of God. These wars are not always outside the church. We're not always fighting non-Christians. We're fighting within ourselves so many times. And where do they come? It's from the sin in our own heart. That's the first step in becoming not a Miriam, in removing worldliness from our lives, in drawing closer to Jesus, and in becoming satisfied with the calling God has had for us. The very first step is recognizing sin in our own lives, okay? We're really quick to recognize it in someone else. If you've ever had a child that was like you, You were like, holy mackerel, where did that come from? And then you realize, oh, they are just like me. God gave me three. (laughs) And those three, I look at them sometimes and I go, ooh, I know you didn't get that from your dad. (laughs) That's me all the way, right? But we're so quick to recognize it in others and so slow to recognize it in ourselves. Why is that? I think it's because Satan loves to leave us blind to our own faults. Because if we're blind to our own faults, then we don't think we need God. We don't think we need help. We don't recognize our need for healing. 
First John 1 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I love Psalm 139, 23 and 24. It says, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Sometimes we need to ask God, God, I know this this is going to be terrible. I'm going to hate this. But would you put a mirror in front of me so that I can see something that needs fixed? I can't always see it. Lord, can you show me in my own heart where I'm struggling with this? And he will. He's so faithful. So first you recognize the sin in your heart. Then you recognize God's power to free you of these things. Because there's no point in coming to a God who has no power to change you. If you think, oh, I keep doing this sin and there's nothing that can stop me. Well, if you believe that, then you're right. There's nothing that's going to be able to stop you from doing it again and, and falling back into it again. But if you recognize that God has the ability to change your heart, to, to renew your happiness with where you're at, to give you a love for that husband who is unlovable in that moment, to give you a heart for your children that you haven't had for a long time, if you think he can, then he can. Because part of it is coming to him and having the faith that he is who he says he is in your life, that he can help you. And he does it through his grace. That verse where it says that he gives more grace in verse 6. He gives more and more and more and more and more. You can't outspend it. Lord, I gave up all my grace today. I have no more for my husband. Okay, I'll give you more. (laughs) Okay, all right, I guess I can handle it a little bit more, right? He gives us more and gives us the power to do it. A big part of this, you guys, is doing this out loud. If you're really struggling with something, you need to speak it. Lord, I have a problem with this. And it's amazing the power that that thing loses in your life when you actually admit it out loud or write it down. I have a problem with this, okay? And then the next step is, God, I know you can fix this. I know you can. Would you help me? Do you ask God for help? Because asking him for help is putting yourself in a position recognizing you need help. And that's big. There are people in this world who will never ask for help. I got it, Lord. I got this. I'll take care of it my way. I could not heal my own heart's desire to be a pastor's wife. I couldn't make myself happy. I can't make myself be content with what I have, but God did. God did, and that's not something that hurts anymore. When my family all goes off to pastor's wife's retreats, I'm rejoicing that I get to stay home. (laughs) I really am, and I didn't do that in me. God did that in me, and I know he did because I asked him to, and he did it. He's there to help, but we need to ask him, humble ourselves. The other parts, they're pretty simple, you guys, in in concept. They're not super easy to do always. Um, Verse 7, it says, resist the devil. That means you got to not do what you're wanting to do. (laughs) When it's that show and you just want to watch it, you resist him and you shut it off. And you say, no, enemy, you're not going to take that time away from me today. No, enemy, I'm not going to fall into commenting on that Facebook post that I want to... I'm not going to do it. I'm going to log out and I'm going to go do something else. When you make an action to resist the enemy in your life, the Bible says he will flee from you. He will. And then if you constantly resist, he'll get so tired of trying to tempt you when you never fall for it that all of a sudden he'll stop trying to tempt you in that way and you'll get past that thing in your life. You will because this is God's instructions. It's his ABC. Do this and it will work because he promises it will. Verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do you ever have a moment of feeling that the Lord is so far? I have. I've had moments where I just feel dry, and I just feel like, God, I need to hear from you, and I'm just not. My life is just day after day, and I'm missing something. Well, the key is drawing near to him, and then he will draw near to us. Sometimes as Christians, we want all the promises. We want all the benefits without any of the work. We don't want to do the draw near part. We just want him to be near to whatever we're doing. And he says, no, it doesn't work that way. You come near to me and trust me, I will come near to you. Now, if you think, well, what does draw near mean? You have homework this week. I want you to take that homework and say, all right, 
I'm going to sit down with a list, and I'm going to say, how do I draw near to God? And have the Lord show you. Lord, how do I draw near to you this week? I'm not even going to give you one answer to that. You're going to do that. Now, you don't, I'm not going to ask you about it next week. This homework is for your benefit. Your job is to please the Lord, not to please me. <laughs> I got enough homework on my own. I'm not going to study yours, okay? I, I'm not your babysitter. But if you want to draw near, if you want the Lord's present more in your life, if you want to see more of him, then you take a paper out this week and you say, Lord, how do you want me to draw near to you right now? What does it mean? Does it mean, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not even going to say one suggestion. That's up to you, okay? Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, verses 8 through 10. Step five, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. We forget that God is holy. And if we want to really draw near to him, we draw near to him with holy hands and hearts. Now, that doesn't mean perfection. That doesn't mean, oh, I've got to clean up my life before I get close to the Lord. No, it means, all right, Lord, I'm coming near to you, and I know that that means you need you put your finger on this one thing in my life that I need to change and that I need to, I need to cleanse. I need to get rid of this. Lord, would you help me? Lord, would you show me how to get past this? He will, but that's part of it. We need to weep over our sin and leave it behind, knowing what it cost him, knowing what it cost him. Humble yourself, and I love six. Six is the benefit, right? The last step, it's in verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and what? He will lift you up. He'll lift you up right out of that problem you thought you were having. He'll lift your spirits right up out of that despair or discouragement or depression that you were in. He'll do it. He promises this is his method. We have our job, and then he will do his. He will lift us up. I feel so bad for Miriam. I wish she had James. She didn't have James to turn to, to say, what do I do to get out of this? Now, I'm sure she could have talked to the Lord, and he could have helped her. I hope he did. I, we don't know. We'll have to ask her when we get to heaven. Miriam, how did that all work out for you after that? Because, you know, we all know that bad part about you getting leprosy and, you know, being jealous. But how did that work out for you? Hopefully it's a good story. But I know for you and I, there's hope. There's possibility right now to change, to change what it is. Um, I want you guys to read with me really quick. I have one more verse, one more verse I want to read. It's still here in James, still in chapter 4. Jump down really quick to verse 14. This is why we need to do this now. Some of us, when God tells us and pokes us and said, hey, I want you to work on this, we say, oh, next month. I got too much on my plate right now, Lord. Or, ah, uh, he's not really speaking to me. I can let this one go. This one isn't that big a deal. James says, no, no, this is why. In verse 14, James chapter 4, 14, he says, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. We do not know our time. We think we have all this time left. Can I share with you something the Lord put on my heart this week? So I am super hard on my oldest daughter. She's 10, Alora. And I don't know if it's just because it's the oldest thing where I just expect so much from her. She is an amazing kid. She really is. She is a sweetheart and she is sensitive and she, she's just my, my right arm. She really, I don't think anything would get done in my house if I didn't have Alora to, Alora, could you? You know, and she's like, sure, Mom, sure, Mom. You know, she's not the one you have to fight with. She's the one who's like, Mom, what can I help you with today? And I'm like, oh, I wish every kid was like you. But I, that also makes me really hard on her. When I see something that I don't like in her life or whatever, man, do I come down like. Part of my thought process in doing that is, I'm training her, Lord. I'm training her so that when she's older, when she's my age, she'll be just so much farther than I was. You know, when she's a teenager, she won't struggle with the things I struggled with if I nip these things in the bud right now. She'll have all these years, right? And I'm trying to think in the future. And I was reading this this week, and the Lord said, Andrea, what if Alora has only two more years left? What if she does? And you're spending all this time trying to correct every little thing in her heart for when she's 50. What if she's not going to be 50? 
and you're treating her this way, and she's 10. You're not treating her like she's 10. You're treating her like she's 17. And what if she's never going to be 17? And I go, oh, Lord, you're so right. Sometimes I'm trying to correct things that I think the Lord will happen in the future, and the Lord says, no, look at now. Andrea, if I want you to correct something now, you need to do it now because there's something else for you in the future, or maybe there is no future. Or Andrea, with your daughter, you need to let some of these things go now because maybe there isn't a future. And I hope, I've, you know, obviously my prayer as a mom, she's got a long life. I foresee her getting married and having 100 babies and I get to be grandma and, you know, all those kinds of visions of the future. But I think, Lord, teach me to number our days. Teach me to remember to number the days, both in the sense of getting done now what you want me to correct and do now, and, I don't know, not being so hard on the certain things that might not be in the future. Does that make sense? I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that was something he was showing me this week very much, of teaching me to number my days. Why? Because pleasing God is the goal for our lives. It's where we will find happiness. It's where we will find fulfillment. Not chasing after what someone else's ministry is, but living the life he has for us now. Whether it be with one person or 10 people or a schoolroom full of people or whatever it is, it's all right, God, where is it now? I'm sure there's some of you, I think of um, Robin, who could come up and share about times when God had them in seasons where they were ministering to older parents. And that ministry took up every ounce of strength and time and life. I know my mom is going into that season because my 98-year-old grandmother will be moving in with us, with her. And I know that that's going to change because she goes from being an independent grandmother, you know, having her own house, to now taking care of another person that's going to take a whole lot more time. New mothers have that same thing where your whole life is dedicated to keeping this little thing fed and changed and, you know, sleeping and gosh, it's so hard and you think, God, I can't do anything. My life is on pause because I'm focused on this one person. And God says, no, that's not pause. That's where I, this is your purpose. This is what's pleasing me because who are you doing it for? Who hired you? Who gave you this parent? Who gave you this baby? Who gave you this irritating, annoying neighbor? I planted them next to you because I want you to be that light in their life right now. I don't need you to teach 700 people. I've got them covered. I want you with this one person, this three people, these three little people, whoever they are, they're in your life for now. Ladies, ladies, let us give these to him. Let us seek pleasing him in whatever ministry it is that he's given us, whether we're a Miriam, whether we're a Moses, whether we're whoever it is, let us discover the paths to pleasing God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you're the God of variety, that none of us has the same jobs. You make it Gosh, so great and big for each of us. Lord, plant in our hearts the ministries you have for us now. Maybe they're even different than ones 10 years ago or 10 years in the future. Lord, maybe they're small and seemingly insignificant. To you, Lord, not even the smallest seed is insignificant. To you, Lord, it is everything. And because it is important to you, make it important to us. Lord, may we number our days. May we consider, Lord. And if there are things that you want to cleanse us from, like James 4 talks about, if there are attitudes or bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, Lord, if there are those things in our life, help us to follow your instructions to humble ourselves and to get rid of them, Lord, so that you can cause new growth. Father, whom you love, you discipline. We're your kids. We need spanked sometimes. So, Lord, show us. Hold up those mirrors to us, Lord, and help us to love as you love. Help us to see through your eyes, Lord, and to consider those things precious that you consider precious. 
Thank you, Lord, for Miriam and her example. Give her a big hug for us up there in heaven. And uh, Lord, just walk before each one of us this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.